Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Eh, Soledad Santos, editorial, el director of Spring and Healthcare en Avenida América, en Spring and Nature. Erika Pastrana, editorial director of Nature Journals at New York. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jose Maria Medina, and I'm the scientific advisor to the Ramon Areces Foundation. And on behalf of the foundation, I give you thanks for your attendance to this event. This is the 15th edition of the cycle held in this uh, foundation with the collaboration of science and nature. And this year, we'll deal with cellular uh, therapies and new opportunities from genetic engineering. And until now, we have dealt with genetic tests, uh, personalized medicine, autoimmune diseases, infectious emergent diseases, diabetes mellitus type 2, regenerative medicine, neurodegenerative diseases, and last uh, year's the CO2 capture techniques. So both the Ramon Areces como Spring and Nature consider the essential to deal today with cell therapy, new opportunities under the hands of genetic engineering immunotherapy. The reasons to choose it were several and particularly relevant. In, it is true that cell therapy based on cell administration to fight a disease have experienced in the, in the last few years an enormous uh, growth in their clinical application. And in fact, the success of the CAR T cells, for example, which are genetically uh, manipulated to deal with lymphomas, the uh, success for solid cancers and hematological cancers, and the use of stem cell therapy for um, corneal damage and so on and so forth. Uh, this aim of this uh, meeting has to be in the has come to deal with the recent uh, uh, clinical applications in lymphoma and solid cancer. We think that the collaboration of Spring and Nature has made it possible, enabling it, as you will see during this cycle of conferences. Y finalmente quisiera agradecer a todos los ponentes que eh, se han mm, molestado en asistir a la reunión, sobre todo en particular los que vienen del extranjero. Estoy muy seguro de que su participación en esta eh, reunión va a dar lugar a un foro espléndido donde podremos eh, conversar sobre los últimos avances en el campo. Así que en nombre de la Fundación Ramón Areces, Muchísimas gracias por haber venido. Y ahora le voy a dar la palabra a Soledad Santos Suárez. Muchas gracias. Welcome to the 15th edition of the debates organized by the Spring and Nature uh, Fund Ramon Areces Foundation. After meeting online, we have now have a physical meeting. Last year, the pandemic forced us to go online, and we wanted to see the whole full with people eager to listen to science. Now, thanks to immunology and vaccines, we have been able to overcome the pandemic, and we can meet again for these lectures. As Jose Maria has said, this year we will deal with the advances of cell therapies, and our speakers will tell us about the latest advances in immunotherapy and genetic in engineering. Those who have attended the meetings during the past 15 years will know about our passion for deep understanding the knowledge of our own cells to deal with diseases, as we did when we 
activated uh, regenerative uh, medicine or organoid for new possibilities. The advances in cell therapy and gene therapy go hand in hand today, although during decades gene therapy had not uh, been made efficient enough to show a clear um, benefit. The advances in the genetic engineering of our immune system has allowed us to advance in the use of uh, cell therapy for treatment of hematological cancers and solid tumors as well, as we shall learn from our speakers. At Springer Nature, we are committed with uh, disseminating and contributing with the latest scientific advances to the public in general and to foster and be a vehicle for dialogue between the society at large, the scientific world, and the industry. So that's why this year we have published a number of collections focusing on genetic engineering with uh, treatises on immune cells and viral vectors in the collection series of Spring and Healthcare and Spring and Nature. We go for basic science and its applicability with technological uh, applications so as we can introduce these new therapies into routine clinical practice. One year more, we thank the Ramon Areces Foundation for the opportunity to undertake these conferences and we thank the scientific committee as represented by Professor Emilio Boza and Jose Maria Benina, with their commitment with advances in science and medicine. Every year, they propose very interesting topics. And we also thank the general director of the foundation, Mr. Raimundo Perez Hernández Torre, Mr. Fernando Falcón, the director of communication, their trust placed uh, on us to go on organizing these meetings that we enjoy so much. And lastly, I'd like to thank the speakers, uh, Elena Garralda, Luca Villar, Corica Prascana, Evelyn Urich, to have come to Madrid to share your view on cell therapy. Finally, I'd like to thank Erika Prascana, the editorial director of the uh, Nature Journals, the moderation. Thank you very much for your passion and your good work. Uh, good, thank you very much, everybody, and I hope you enjoy the discussion and the presentations. And now I give the floor to Erika Pastrana. Muchas gracias a todos por venir. Thank you very much for coming. It's a pleasure to watch the room full again. And I think this is the seventh year I was given the honor of participating in these conferences. I want to thank the Foundation once again for bringing science topics to an afternoon here in Madrid so that we can all benefit of uh, listening to four uh, world experts, their latest opinions and discoveries. I encourage you all to participate. The spirit under which we organize these live meetings is having a discussion, live uh, discussion, debate, uh, conversation, and a moderation afterwards. So uh, this afternoon's uh, format will be the following. The speakers will deliver their lectures will follow their most recent results, and then afterwards we'll have a general debate. And please, I encourage you to post questions and participate. As the other uh, speakers, I would like to introduce the topic for those of you who are not experts, although the majority of the audience knows about it. Uh, the cell therapies have been with us for many years, and in the last uh, 50 years, uh, we've seen the power and application in the clinic. Uh, the many advances have come from basic science, genetic engineering, the most basic techniques of genome manipulation. So it's really a pleasure uh, to see how uh, research um, joins hands uh, with basic uh, knowledge and clinical application. I hope this uh, session will allow us to have a glimpse of all the different aspects. Uh, first, Luca Biasco will speak about advances in transplantation of stem cells. Then doctors uh, Elena Carrana and Evelyn Urich will talk about immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is one of the most patent uh, applications of cell therapy, particularly engineering T 
T-cells and NK cells to kill tumors. And then finally, Dr. Weisse will talk about the incorporation of more advanced uh, technologies on biomaterials and other strategies to develop what we hope will be the new generation of cell therapy in the future. So I hope it will be a very stimulatory meeting and keep your questions afterwards to participate in the debate. Without further ado, I'll introduce our first speaker this afternoon, Dr. Luca Biasco. Luca is the executive director of the Center of Biotechnology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and is a professor of the University College in London at uh, the Gene Therapy of the Children's Hospital Great Hormones. Dr. Luca Biasco was part of the uh, team behind the, the Sbelis, which is the first uh, commercially approved in the world. And he was a consultant for Wiscotaldry syndrome and at the Boston Children's Hospital and in the Dana Farber Cancer Institute has been responsible for the study of the vectors of gene therapy. And at the Harvard Medical School directed a laboratory of research on the project of gene therapy in stem cells and its behavior uh, after transfusion in vivo to humans. Dr. Biasco will talk about this, the latest advances in the use of uh, stem cells by means of gene therapy and showing us the latest techniques of in vivo administration. So you have the floor. Thank you, Erica, for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm Italian. I understand Spanish, but I cannot speak a word, a couple of words, maybe. So forgive me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give my talk in English. And do you have the pointer in the switcher? Ah, yeah, there it is. Okay. So first of all, let me thank the organizers for the uh, opportunity to present our work here today. This presenta presentation is divided into two parts. The first one deals with my work, and uh, I'm going to tell you a story about our research project at University College of London. And the second part, I'm going to talk about our research endeavors at Sana Biotechnology. <coughs> OK, I hope it works. Let's see if it works like that. It's not tricky really moving forward. Can I get the technical uh, help here? I should push this. OK. Now we're there. Uh, thank you. These are my disclosures. Now, as you may know, uh, human adult hematopoiesis is organized hierarchically. At the top, we have hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, C34 cells, that are located in the bone marrow. And they are able to generate a variety of blood cells with a, diff with a different function. The CD34 compartment here in pink is heterogeneous. At the very top of the pyramid, you have hematopoietic stem cells and multipotent progenitors. And instead, and these, these cells at the top are um, able a long-term survival and of generating uh, old blood cells. Well, instead, a little bit at the bottom, you have a megacarrier erythroid, uh, multipoid, uh, myeloid, and multilymphoid progenitors that are instead more um, specifically um, able to generate only certain uh, branches of human hepatopoiesis. Now, genetic defects that affect specific differentiation branches would result in defect in certain, uh, the production of certain blood cells, for example, red blood cells, neutrophils, or monocytes, or lymphoid cells. So naturally, the ability to deliver a therapeutic period in the CD34 compartment would unlock the possibility to treat a variety of blood cell disorders. And uh, this is the concept at the basis of uh, hematopoietic stem progenitor uh, cell and gene therapy. And uh, the most common approach to do HSPC gene therapy is the one that is described in this scheme. CD34 cells are isolated from a patient. They are uh, transduced with a viral vector. The most commonly used are lentiviral retroviral vectors that would add a correct copy of an otherwise mutated gene. 
These cells need to be expanded in vitro and uh, activated with cytokines to achieve and to boost the transduction, to achieve a better transduction by the vector. And then the cells are reinfused back into the patient. And the patients need to be conditioned with a low dose chemotherapy to uh, make space in the bone marrow for the transplanted transplant cells to own back the bone, uh, in the bone marrow of the patient. Now, why I mentioned that lentiviral and retroviral vectors are the most used for this approach? The reason is that um, these vectors have certain features that make them very suited for this type of uh, application. First, they have an envelope that is coated with glycoproteins, in particular, the most, one, uh, most commonly used one is the vesicular stomatitis virus G protein that allows for a fusion with CD34 cells. Also, they are able to permanently integrate a correct version of the gene in the host uh, genome. That means that the cells that receive the therapeutic correction will uh, permanently, permanently host the therapeutic gene, and also the daughters of the cells of replication will inherit the same uh, correction. The thing you should know for this presentation is that the place where the therapeutic cassette is integrated in the genome is semi-random, which means that the vector can decide essentially whatever place in the genome to deliver the um, external material. Now, this is important for the safety of the vector, and certain areas of the genome are more um, complicated to um, deal with, and you don't want to disrupt certain regulations of these areas. But today I'm going to talk about how we can use this semi-random integration site distribution to track the fate of the engineered cells directly in the patient. And the concept is relatively simple. Each transduced cells becomes univocally marked by an individual insertion site which will be different from the other cells. And the daughters of these cells will also have the same insertion site. So we have a stable molecular barcode in these, in these cells. Once you infuse the cells back into the patients and you follow the patients over time, you can collect different peripheral blood populations that derived from the stem cells through a technique called insertion site analysis, you can uh, amplify vector genome junctions, and you can collect the positions of the vector uh, in the genome and the relative abundance. The relative abundance is essentially a measurement of how many cells has the same exact insertion site because they derive from the same mother cells. And then you can uh, track them over time in the patients and analyze how many insertion sites were shared across different blood populations, which would mean that they derive, derive from a common progenitor. Now, for this presentation, I want you to familiarize with these two types of uh, visualization. The one on the left is a bubble plot. Each bubble is an insertion site. The bigger it is the bubble, the higher it is the number of cells that carry the insertion site. You can use insertion site abundance and diversity to uh, essentially track the clonal diversity of a certain population over time. In this scheme in particular, you're looking at the diversity of naivety cells over many months and years after gene therapy. On the right, you have an heat map. Each row is an insertion site, and you can see whether these insertion sites were detected in multiple cell, T cell types and uh, in a multiple time point. And you can see that they, they were, we see some insertion that is detected in different T cells of population, but also in NK cells that are shown here in green. So it's clonal diversity and sharing of insertion sites. These are two key readouts. This is another um, type of analysis uh, uh, were exploited in, in some of our publications. It's, if you are specifically interested in this, a niche in this field of clonal tracking in gene therapy patients, you might want to check out some of these papers that we published over the past years. And today I'm going to talk about the second last year uh, that we published in Nature Communications. In particular, this work was conducted in the context of uh, uh, primary immunodeficiency, a gene therapy for primary immunodeficiency. This is a SCIDX1 primary immunodeficiency where uh, patients are born with a genetic defect that essentially um, generate missing lymphoid lineages. These patients are not able to produce B cells, NK cells, or T cells. 
So with autogous transplantation of CD34 cells that are gene corrected with the gamma retroviral vector and coding for the IL2 receptor gamma chain gene, then you can infuse back a few corrected cells in the patients and the few corrected cells in the patients will be able to regenerate the missing branch. So now these patients are able to produce again these uh, missing lymphoid cells. Of course, if you target the really long-term HSCs, the one at the very top of the pyramid, you should also see the presence of the vector in other blood cell types because these stem cells will produce all other blood cells. Now, this is just a few information on the trial. Ten patients have been treated in London. They are all alive and well to date. One patient developed uh, uh, acute lymphoid leukemia 24 months after gene therapy, but was resolved after chemo chemotherapy and remained disease-free until now. In this early trial, they didn't use any conditioning to make space in the bone marrow because they thought it was sufficient for few stem cells to engraft in the bone marrow that you would have already that selective advantage for generating that missing branch. And what you should know is that this is one of the first gene therapy trials. Now is now more than 20 years after the treatment of these patients. And it provides one of the longest follow-up of hematopoietic stem cell gene therapy trial available. So all the information we gather from these patients are very useful. Now, what, what do we see in the peripheral blood of these patients? This patient produced T cells and NK cells, and uh, these two populations were the only one that contained the vector. We don't have any therapeutic gene detected in B cells, monocytes, neutrophils, or other blood cells. We think that this is the result of the fact that we have lost the long-term surviving HSCs at the top of the pyramid, and what you see, only, uh, what you see now is uh, the first hypothesis we had is that this is the persistence of memory lymphocytes in the peripheral blood that can stick around for many, many years, even decades after, um, after gene therapy. So if that is the case in these patients, you should only see memory cells, which are the one in the black square. You shouldn't see any naive T cells because naive T cells are the ones that are freshly produced from the thymus and they are short living. And so you need a stem cells to produce this red, red blood cell. But here, surprise, to our surprise, uh, we found cells that fall in this red gate uh, in all patients up to the latest time point. So this patient had naive T cells but they were not coming from engineered stem cells because they were simply not there anymore in the bone marrow. So where they were coming from, we hypothesized that there is a long-term lymphoid progenitus that is able to keep producing these naive T cells in, in the patients. So we decided to challenge our hypothesis. Is this an aberrant finding or is this uh, true? Because it wasn't described before that this population even existed. So first, we wanted to confirm that these were functionally naive T cells. So we isolated these subpopulations from patients, and we treated them with PMA and yonomycin, and we measured the interferon gamma production. The expectation is that naive T cells should not produce interferon gamma upon this stimulation. And that, and that was exactly the case. All the other memory subtypes produced interferon gamma, but naive T cells were not able to produce this uh, molecule. And this was a functional assay that confirmed that we were observing naive T cells. We also look at TCR rearrangement from the thymus, and we could see that there was a high variety, high diversity of TCR rearrangement in this naive T cell compartment in different patients and at different time points. This was uh, a reflection of the fact that uh, na naive T cells were continuously produced uh, from the thymus with new TCR rearrangements. And yes, they contained the vector, and they were vector positive, and we could track the insertion sites in these uh, naive T cells, and as you can see, the diversity was maintained over time. We didn't see any sign of substantial clonal expansion in this population. Also, we could detect insertion site in naive T cells in red in this heat map that were shared with other T cell subtypes, which was meaning that these naive T cells were differentiating, were generating all the memory cells as is expected of them. And also, we recaptured identical insertion in naive T cells over time. 
And this led us to estimate uh, that uh, there should be around from 2,000 to 6,000 individual uh, long-term lymphoid progenitor clones that are keeping producing these cells in this patient. Lastly, we could uh, also find identical insertions shared between T cells and NK cells. And this uh, led us to think that these long-term lymphoid progenitors might be able to generate both cell types. So from a single progenitor, you, uh, you can generate uh, both NK cells and uh, T cells. So these and other uh, assays that we performed in the context of these studies uh, allowed us to um, confirm that we discovered the output of a yet-to-be-described long-term lymphoid progenitor population with a bipotent T and NK long-term potential that is able to survive independently from the supply from hematopoietic stem cells for at least 15 years. So this become a very uh, interesting cellular target for gene therapy, and we are now trying to identify where these lymphoid progenitors live, and if we have a marker that we can use to isolate them and engineer them. Now, switching gear to the second part of the presentation, I'm going to talk about our work at SANA Biotechnology a bit. So I, I, I talked about ex vivo gene therapy. So this works, is a system that works well, but is expensive. It's a drug that is very expensive to, to manufacture because you have to take the cells, transplant them back, and uh, um, also you have to condition the patient to give chemo chemotherapy. So it's not the best scenario for patients, and, and you can have some toxicity associated to the conditioning. Uh, on the contrary, what if instead we were able to just infuse the vector directly in intravenously and let the vector reach the bone marrow, reach the right cells directly in the bone marrow? You would have a much uh, cheaper drug. It would be easier and cost-effective manufacturing. You wouldn't de need the conditioning arrangement. You don't need to make space for the, for the cells in the bone marrow because they are already there and you would improve greatly the access to the patients. That's exactly what we are working on at SANA, try to develop an in vivo uh, HSPC gene therapy. And when you work on a preclinical development of this, of this kind, you, uh, you have limited options. You can isolate the stem cells from, a, from an individual and you can either test them in vitro or you can transplant them in permissive animal models that would generate a sort of human hematopoietic system in the mouse. And we used exactly the, these two different approaches. I want to just give you today a glance of the three key questions we are trying to address. First question, can we genetically engineer naive HSPCs with high efficiency? Can we get to the hematopoietic stem progenitor cells in vivo? And can we get to these cells potentially specifically? Can we avoid correcting other cells and just get only to the stem cells? So regarding the first question, I mentioned that to transduce CD34 cells, you need to activate them with cytokine. You need to let them stim to stimulate them. The point is that you cannot do that in vivo, of course. The cells are in their niche. So you have to find a way to enter these cells without activation. We tested different compounds, and I want to show you this example here, where we, show, we are showing a comparison between a lentiviral vector that is uh, um, as a VSBG envelope, that is the one that I described before, that requires activation of CD34 cells. And in comparison, you can see another envelope that we are testing that is uh, derived from a baboon virus that uh, um, instead, here shown uh, in red, is able to transduce very efficiently resting cells. So these results you are show I'm showing here is on cells that are not activated. And you can see that clearly the baboon virus works much better than the VSVG uh, um, version of the vector. Also, the BVTR vector is able to enter uh, different subtypes. So you can isolate the HSCs, MPPs specifically, and transduce them without activation. And clearly, you can have a good level of transduction, even a low dose of BVTR. Another thing that makes this uh, particular uh, virus interesting is that it seems to avoid or to, have, uh, uh, to be less prone, at least, to transduce primary human hepatocytes. Why this is important? Because when you infuse a vector intravenously, one of the first uh, things that the vector will, will see is the liver. So if a lot of vector gets trapped, there is a problem, both on the toxicity standpoint, but also because it, you don't have enough vector to get to the right cells. So BVTR seems to avoid this compartment, so it makes it for a very suitable candidate to use in vivo. 
Talking about in vivo, can we get to these cells when they are in the bone marrow? Um, a way to test this is to humanize mice. So you take 34 cells, you put them in a mouse, and then 12 weeks later, you infuse the vector. And the 12 days later, you sacrifice the mice and you see where, uh, you, which type of cells you have transduced. Now, one thing you should know is that this, the human cells change in nature when they stay in the mouse for such a long time. So here on the left, on the pie chart on the left, you have the composition of the CD34 cells uh, freshly uh, tra uh, transplanted in the mouse. On the right, you see that you have a majority of cells now are pre-B and K progenitors, and you have, as a consequence, a lot of B cells in the peripheral blood. So this is not a normal hematopoiesis, human hematopoiesis, and your HC target, the one you read, is much, much smaller than what it is in the human compartment. So the situation you, you find yourself in is the following. You are infusing your vector in an environment with a lot of B cells and B cells progenitors, and you are hoping to eat some stem cells. Now, having said that, with BAVTR, we achieved already very good levels of in vivo transduction, up to 8% of total uh, human cells in the peripheral blood, which correspond to 2% of uh, the lineage negative 34 positive cells, so that tiny fraction of cells in the bone marrow that we want to target. And again, you can see the difference between BAVTR and VSVG in orange. The VSVG essentially is uh, um, poor, very poorly performing in, that, in this context. Now, the last question is, can we eat these cells with high specificity? Can we avoid other cell types and just go into HSPCs? Now, to do that, you have to further modify the envelope. And at SANA, we are developing retargetable fusogens that are incorporated in the membrane of the vector, and they contain uh, uh, binding sites that are designed to rec recognize a specific receptor that is present at the surface of the HSCs. And after the binding with this receptor, you trigger a conformational change in the fusion monomer associated to this complex that would then promote the fusion between the viral membrane and the cell membrane and would promote the delivery of the genetic payload inside the right cells. So here I'm talking about an example where we generated a fusos of uh, HSC targeted fusos on B that is supposed to transduce only receptor B positive cells. How many of these cells you have in these mice? Very few. Um, they are only located in the bone marrow, so the vector has to make all the whole way from the peripheral blood to the bone marrow and eat only these cells in a specific niche. And they are as few as 0.6% of the total human population. So your target in this mouse is that tiny little blue slice. So, we transduce this, uh, we try, we infuse in these mice both a broad fusogen and a, and a receptor B specific fusogen. And when we use the HC specific fusogen, you see that you clearly enrich for targeting these blood cells, these blue cells here in this, in this scheme, where instead when you use a broad fusogen, you clearly target a lot of the other cells that are in the gray section. So, yes, we think it's doable. We are working on improving the numbers and the reach of these specific uh, uh, HSCs and to generate new fusions that, uh, that work even better in the context of, of uh, human application. So, this is another data that I didn't have time to show you today, and I'm going to conclude here. Um, show that we can reach to uh, hematopoietic stem progenitor cells in the peripheral blood and in the bone marrow in different compartments. So we are now working on improving our strategies to get the, more, uh, get the highest potency and specificity in this context. And I don't have time to go into the details on this. I just wanted to uh, leave you with a take-home message. When you are approach such a complex applications preclinically, you have to divide your problems in tiny little pieces and address each question individually. And only then you can put together the pieces of the puzzle because there, there's no uh, experimental model that you can use that will address all the questions at once. And that's why I showed you that they were uh, testing them separately. And with that, let me thank uh, uh, the group at UCL that helped me a lot with the first part of the project, in particular the Antrasha, Natalia Zotova, Christine Rivat, and our collaborator at the Crick Institute. And this instead is my team at Sana Biotechnology, Anjali, Sean, Vlad, and Casey, all our collaborators, Jagesh, my boss, and uh, all of you for your attention. Thank you.
Muchas gracias al doctor Viasco por esta presentación tan interesante. Bien, pasamos al siguiente tema. Eh, de la mano de la doctora, la, profe eh, la profesor Evelyn Ulrich. Uh, la doctora Ulrich es catedrática de inmunología celular en la Universidad Johann Wolfgang Goethe am Main, en Alemania. Dirige la unidad de investigación de inmunología experimental y la unidad de supervivencia del cáncer del Hospital Universitario Goethe de Frankfurt. La doctora Ulrich se licenció en medicina en la Universidad Albert Ludwig de Friburgo y recibió formación complementaria en las universidades de Ratisbona, Erlangen y París. Es especialista en medicina interna e inmunología. Desde el 2012 dirige la unidad de inmunología experimental del Hospital Infantil de Frankfurt con el apoyo del Centro LOEV de Terapia Celular Higiénica de Frankfurt. Ha participado en la caracterización de los subconjuntos de células Natural Killer o NK y linfoides innatas. La investigación actual de la doctora Ulrich se centra en descifrar la regulación inmunitaria y en desarrollar inmunoterapias celulares centradas en la utilización de ingeniería genética eh, para mejorar la aplicación clínica de esta tecnología. En la charla de hoy, la doctora Ulrich nos hablará de los usos de la ingeniería genética para mejorar la eficiencia de la inmunoterapia. Muchas gracias. Yeah, it's a great pleasure um, to talk here today for this of this audience, and um, thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Um, I want to get you now, after we heard um, so many interesting topics about stem cell um, engineering, um, towards genetic engineering of immune cells, um, with a recent perspective on immune cells beyond um, the very well-known CAR T cells. So these are my disclosures. And um, as an introduction, I want to highlight that immunity or immune cell research started just 60 years ago. And um, it's unbelievable what happened in these 60 years, and especially in the last um, 10 years, um, since genetic engineering of immune cells is possible. So T cells were first discovered by microscopical description from thymic tissues in 1961, and then natural killer cells have been discovered even 15 years later, 1975. And um, I will not go in detail about this slide, but maybe you are interested to get some more insights. It's quite interesting how it started to um, firstly try to treat patients with immune cells because, I mean, it's quite logical that an, um, a cancer patient maybe lack uh, sufficient immunity and it could be helpful to replace immunosuppressed immune cells and um, to perform so-called adaptive cell therapy with um, immune cells such as T cells or natural killer cells that are activated by cytokines. And then when we come to recent studies, they are not only activated by cytokines, they are also modified to target cancer cells. And here you see, for instance, a T cell, the smaller cell attacking a leukemic um, blast cell. And um, I, I believe um, most of you heard about that, but um, it's always, again, important to mention that really um, it was a breakthrough in cellular immunotherapy that um, 10 years ago, a um, white hat could be treated at UPAN with a CD90 CAR T cell product. I will explain um, what it is in a few minutes. And this um, children suffered from acute lymphatic leukemia, was not treatable anymore. And um, now you can see that we are um, 10 years after her immunotherapy with engineered CD19 CAR T cells. And uh, she's growing up, and um, I just had a chance to listen to a talk by her father last week at a CAR T cell meeting organized by the European Bone Marrow Transplantation and EHA Society. And it was really um, yeah, a big moment to see that she is cancer-free and cured from cancer disease. 
by such a therapy. What is a CAR? It's not a CAR, it's a chimeric antigen receptor construct, um, a sort of um, fusion uh, molecule um, targeting um, molecules at the surface of the tumor cell and, um, and by a single chain um, domain. And then um, this construct has activating um, domains and signaling domains to activate the immune cells once the immune cell encounters or targets specifically this molecule that's expressed on exactly that tumor cells that need to be killed. And the person who first described chimic antigen receptor is Selig Escher from Weizmann Institute. But it took a long way until the first um, studies with CAR T cells then um, for patient treatment. Uh, in, and it's not a single person, it's a group around Carl Schoen um, at uh, UPAN um, is, that um, really developed this product. And the important next step is that this CAR T cell product can be engineered for a huge um, number of cell patients now, um, as it has been approved by FDA and later in Europe by the EMA. And um, following the Chimeria product, that's the CD19 CAR T cell product from um, Novartis, yes, Carta came out by Kai Gilead, and then some other um, FDA-approved um, cell therapies, but not that many, however. And we will discuss why we only have a limited number of approved CAR T cell products so far. Um, it's, um, four, there are four existing products targeting B cell um, leukemias or lymphomas with CD19 CAR T cell products. And then there are now also two products um, approved um, that target BCMA, that's a surface molecule on multiple myeloma disease, also a hematological disease of bone marrow. How is the treatment strategy using such a CAR immune cell? Um, you need patient or donor blood can isolate T or NK cells then under good medical practice in GMP units. That's a really hardworking procedure. Um, it's important to get the gene for the expression of the CAR into these immune cells to have a safe and stable expression and a viable cell population that's given back to the patient. This cell population needs to proliferate in the patient to be active, to recognize tumor, to kill it. So it's a long procedure but very um, effective. And then now we have a um, uh, growing repertoire of constructs that can um, be used to transduce these cells with um, chimeric antigen receptors. You see there are different generations, first generation, second generation, third generation, fourth generation. Um, these generations are different in their um, stimulatory co-domains, for instance, and signaling domains to activate the immune cells. How many CAR T cell trials are there worldwide? I just wrote above 1,000 um, because it's a growing number. These numbers are from um, end of last year. And, um, in per and you see um, we have um, an increasing number of CAR T cell therapies in the US. And, um, in China, in Asia, in the EU, not that many yet, but it's growing. And um, you see along with that also more and more publications come out and it's really amazing and um, very active field. And that's also important because um, now we are at the phase where we have um, many phase one, phase two trials going on. And um, as you have seen from, from the first, um, uh, gene therapy trials with stem cells, um, as has been reported, we will have also the chance to learn a lot by the results from these studies and by addressing um, the immune cells in patients that have been treated with such products. And um, however you see, we are still in the recruitment procedure, so it will take still a, a while to understand um, all the effects. We, most of these studies are addressed, uh, addressed at unicenter, 
Um, so there are some uh, multi-centered studies. Often it's more um, <laughs> effective to learn from multi-centered studies. And um, most use autologous cells, so meaning cells from patients, patients that have been pretreated. Um, then their T cells are taken out and gene engineered and given back to the patients. And there are only few trials using allogenic cell products. It might be that an allogenic cell product could be um, more viable and uh, more efficient, but this has to be shown. Most clinical trials address single targets. It's feasible, as you will see from preclinical studies, also to have multiple targets addressed. And um, yeah, I mentioned in the beginning why, um, that, why do we have most success in hematology. Um, you can see here that the advantage of treatment with CAR therapy in hematology is that we can focus on targets that are expressed on um, the majority of um, cancer cells or leukemic cells um, in either multiple myeloma or B cell uh, based hematological uh, malignancies. But when we then look at the challenges in solid tumor, there's a high heterogeneity of antigen expression. Then we have the problem that such tumors have a microenvironment. Um, there's limited access to this microenvironment to the tumor site, and tumors can downregulate antigens. And um, in addition, if the antigens are also presented on healthy tissue, we can risk to have toxicity to, to CAR on target, um, but of tumor reactions. Other side effects by CAR T cells that have been reported, even if it's efficient, and these side effects often can be sufficiently treated. Um, there's a cytokine release syndrome. There can be neurotoxicity syndromes called ICANs. And we are not that sure if, if in case that allogenic cell products would have been taken to um, generate engineered CAR T cells, graft versus host disease might occur. And therefore, in the second part of this presentation, I want to give you some insights in a relatively new research topic in my lab, um, where we go beyond T cell engineering and we engineer natural killer cells. So, what is a natural killer cell compared to a T cell? Both are killer cells, if you want to. Both are cells that can attack tumor cells and that can lead to cytotoxicity towards tumor cells. But the T cell has a T cell receptor that's engaged and that needs antigen presentation. Um, and an NK cell has a broad repertoire that makes understanding NK cells a little bit complicated, but it's feasible of inhibitory and activating signals to distinguish between healthy and malignant cells. And um, in both cells, it's possible to introduce a CAR for specific targeting of antigens. And in case of NK cells, it might be advantageous that in addition, there is still then the expression of this inhibitory and activating receptors. And in case of antigen loss, natural cytotoxicity can additionally be mediated by natural killer cells. Furthermore, from the pre-existing clinical experience in some trials with allogenic and K cell products, these cells don't induce graft versus host disease but have a favorable cytokine profile, low risk of side effects. I will not go into detail how NK cells do that, um, but just to understand what it means to have activating and inhibitory signals on a natural killer cells, it means that under steady state, an NK cell is not dangerous. It's no, not killing tissue. Um, and then the um, uh, killing capacity can be induced either by activation, when the activating receptors are uh, positively engaged, or by the lack of inhibitory signals towards the NK cell. However, CAR NK cells are not um, that well studied in the clinic so far. 
you see there is uh, are only few trials in the US, one trial with an NK cell line in Germany, some trials in China, but all these trials are still recruiting, almost are recruiting. One highlight is the first report of CD19 car and K cell preparation that has been given um, by Katie Rutzwani's group at the MD Anderson Cancer Center um, to patients with CLL. And um, the um, report about the first 11 patients, even if it's a low number, showed that it has been um, uh, well perceived treatment, no CRS, no cytotoxicity, and overall. Um, um, response rate was 73%. That's comparable to T cells, but I mean, with 11 patients, it's too early to judge. But it gives a lot of hope and um, inspires the group of persons that work on NK cell products. Um, I will not report about all these studies, just to show you what is addressed so far. I mentioned this um, NK cell study from the US addressing um, CD19. Then there are um, studies that address CD70 and lymphoma. NKG2D is upregulated. Then there are some trials against solid tumors and some trials that don't use primary natural killer cells but use an NK cell line. This can be advantageous to have an off-the-shelf product. And one is um, to target HER2 expressing glioblastoma. In, in Germany at our university center. But today I focus on the primary natural killer cells. And um, I think it's important to study in this context how is the optimal viral or non-viral technology to generate current K cells, um, how is donor selection uh, performed, how to activate these cells, how that, to make them migra migrating optimally, overcoming immunosuppression. I can only focus on two topics. I wanted to sh show you that pseudotyping is also for um, the um, effective transduction with viral products of natural killer cells highly important, and that was a problem in the beginning. Um, since we know um, the expression profile on an NK cell for the intrans receptors, we could find that either ultra-retroviral um, transduction works better than VSVG or and pseudotyping with RD114, or as also mentioned, with baboon pseudotyping. These are um, envelopes on the lentivirals productions that allow better introduction of um, virus in NK cells. But I want also to highlight that there are non-viral strategies, and that might be more cost-effective um, to transduce NK cells. And, um, we are focusing on, um, on a system that allows a stable transduction because many non-viral strategies are not stable. Stable via uh, Sleeping Beauty technology and um, just a historic update um, cloning of ancient DNA has been um, investigated by Svante Perbo who got the Nobel Prize last year. And um, there is another um, work on ancient DNA and Sultan Ivic plays a major role in this. He um, described um, a gene from, um, from an ancient fish DNA that um, he reactivated and can use as a transposase um, in a so-called sleeping beauty technology because he awaked this gene to use it for gene technology. And we have the luck that we can cooperate with Sultan Ivic and we could um, uh, find protocols to efficiently use this transposition technology with Sleeping Beauty um, transposase and a mini circle technology to introduce genes also in natural killer cells. And that it works for gene uh, immune therapy is shown by a recent report from um, Sultan Ivic in cooperation with uh, Michael Hudecek's group. And they have um, uh, the Caramba study going on um, to target SLAMF7 with a Sleeping Beauty transduced CAR T cell product for treatment of multiple myeloma patients. And we are now at um, uh, the stage that um, we also can um, perform this technology and um, as a proof of principle so far, we transduced NK cells with CD19 using mini circles and transposase um, 
technology. We have a high expression of 44% CD19 car expression in these NK cells. And you see that this is also um, effective in treatment of mice. In, in here in these um, images, you see um, the luminescence of leukemic cells because these leukemic cells are transduced with luciferase. This can be monitored by bioluminescence activity, so the mice can continue to live and is monitored for the progression of disease. And you see, when we treated the mice with CD19 chi and K cells, they did have a much slower progression. Um, and one important um, yeah, <laughs> topic to use such non-viral uh, technology is that um, we have um, lower costs, but also the safety of integration plays an important manner. And um, it has been reported for T cells that sleeping beauty transposition integrates the genome in genomic safe harbors. And that's also something that we can confirm for the sleeping beauty technology compared to lentivirus technology in natural killer cells. And at the end, I also selected a highlight um, to target a disease that's more difficult to treat than um, B cell leukemia. It's acute myeloid leukemia because. Um, there are targets that are also expressed on hematopoietic stem cells, and we believe that natural killer cells would be advantageous in that context. So um, we have chosen to use a CD33 car, second generation, also as a proof of principle. These are published data where we use a baboon pseudotype lentiviral vector to get a high highly stable and efficient car transduction in, in K-cells of 52%. We have not only in vitro an increase in cytotoxicity against AML blasts um, and uh, a good uh, cytokine production profile of the so transduced immune cells. You can also see again that we have a good outcome um, and a reduction in progression of leukemia um, after a single dose of such CD33 CAR and K cells. Um, we worked together with the company Miltony to um, make higher numbers of these CD33 CAR and K cells, and we could produce them at another site in Frankfurt, at Miltony's site in Burgess Gladbach, and then transfer them into mice, and we can see also. Um, a huge number of such um, CAR and K cells produced in GMP um, adequate production uh, <laughs> context um, has effect in, in the AML suffering mice. However, as you have seen, the mice still um, will have a relapse of leukemia. And um, we believe that their um, um, checkpoint pathway plays a role to inhibit the CAR-modified immune cells. It's NKG2A that can be knocked out by CRISPR-based ad um, addition of NK cells. And so um, we have a procedure to um, use CRISPR-Cas technology to knock out NKG2A expression in natural killer cells. And now we combine that. First, we have CD33 CAR transduction, then the NKG2A knockout, and um, we test and evaluate the anti-tumor activity. And um, at the end of this presentation, I want as a highlight show you a video clip where you can see how to, a, acute myeloid leukemia blasts can be killed by such dual modified NK cells. And you see the dual modification with this CRISPR knockout and CD33 kind K cells is the highest column in orange compared to single modified NK cells. In green, is the fluorescence of acute myeloid leukemic cells. The NK cells have no color, and what will appear in red is a marker that's called annexine that shows up when the AML cells are dying. And now you see this modified NK cells. 
They are relatively small, but they can attack in serial killing these leukemic cells. And you see how um, in between here one day of um, cytotoxicity in vitro assay, uh, the acute myeloid cells die. And this is quite impressive, and we could also prove it um, in a mouse model. We lowered the dosing, um, but we gave three times um, the dual engineered car knockout and K cells, and um, we see that it's much more efficient than only the therapy with um, single modified NK cells. One thing that was quite interesting for us was that leukemia came back, but not in the bone marrow. And therefore, we performed a transfer of this bone marrow to see if maybe also leukemic stem cells that occur in bone marrow or leukemia initiating cells have been addressed and attacked. And, um, we transferred from all the mice you have seen, the bone marrow, into other um, and mice. These are NSG mice that also produce cytokines that support um, engraftment of leukemia. And you see that we had 100% survival over three months in the mice that got the bone marrow, which has been treated um, with our engineered dual modified NK cells. And in all other mice, the leukemia could be transferred. And with that, I'm at the end of the presentation, and I hope I could emphasize and explain you that um, yeah, engineering of immune cells can really be beneficial for treatment of cancer patients, and especially in hard-to-treat cancers, there are a lot of technologies that can be used now, not only in T cells, maybe also in other immune cell types. One of them I showed you today with NK cells. And if we compare um, and uh, we combine these new technologies and learn which one is the optimal for each um, different tumor entity, I believe we can go a huge step forward in cancer immunotherapy. And I want to thank my group. You see here in red highlighted the people in Frankfurt, um, in red those um, um, whose data have been shown today. And for sure, this work is not possible without cooperation partners, some of them I could mention, and um, with funding. And um, I also thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Ulrich, for that brilliant presentation. And now, Dr. Elena Garralda. Dr. Elena Garralda is the principal investigator in the early development in medication early development unit at the Valdebron, VHO, IO. And she goes for early development, and she has focused on proof of confidence and proof of mechanism with uh, targeted therapies, emphasizing the sign cell signaling, cancer stem cells, and immuno-oncology, and uh, cell therapy for solid tumors. She now works in the so-called first-in-human targeted therapies with efficient uh, combinations of targeted therapies and clinical trials based on biomarkers and studies in uh, selected uh, molecular populations. She links her clinical research with the different uh, application areas at the Institute for to develop new therapies for cancer adapted to the specific uh, traits of each tumor. In her presentation, she will talk about advances in immunotherapy to treat uh, solid tumors. Thank you very much, Elena. So thank you. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you very much, the Ramon Arez uh, Foundation in Springer Nature for inviting me to deliver this lecture. I'd like to talk about the latest advances in the last years with the TIL therapy, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. It's a different cell therapy that uh, uh, means uh, different changes in the last uh, few years. Here are my 
uh, conflicts of interest, uh, none is relevant for today's presentation. Okay, I think it's important to start this by stating that for a tumor to grow, to exist, has to have the capacity to evade the immune system. This is a clear trait of tumors, and it was this discovery of the different mechanisms of escaping the immune system entailed the Nobel Prize of uh, Conjo Con and James Allison because they discovered the PD-1 and CTL-4 immune uh, controllers. It was a breakthrough and a revolution in oncology. Many therapies were developed to inhibit these checkpoints. This is the long-term survival curves in melanoma, which are the most immunogenic uh, tumors that best respond to the current immunotherapy. If you're not familiar with these curves, we have the percentage of patients alive against time. Melanoma stage four patients that receive treatment with these drugs, nivolumab, ipilumab, and we can see that 50% of the patients at five years will not be alive. It's true. These drugs have entailed a clear breakthrough. There are more than 20 indications and approvals for this kind of drugs, and it's really a breakthrough in medicine, but unfortunately, we still have a lot of work ahead of us. There's many things yet to discover so that it would be the majority of patients that benefit from immunotherapy. And if we leave melanoma and we go to other tumors that are less immunogenic, this uh, leaves somewhat to be desired. We have a gap, a therapeutic uh, uh, job ahead of us to improve the results and outcome of our patients. Look at the different number of patients who have a response to the different indications, to the therapy, and look. There's a huge number of tumors that do benefit from the treatment, but the respond only about 20, 30 percent of the cases. So there's still a large room for improvement. And why? Be why do we have to underscore the relevance of cell therapy? We have had, and we will, we have immunotherapy. Uh, uh, to change uh, oncological outcomes, there's still a lot of work to be done. And here is where we have cell therapies. And in cell therapies, there are many kinds. The concept is that we are going to use cells from the patient, which will be modified so that they attack the tumor. There are different types of cell therapy. In the anterior presentation, we focused on cells obtained from the patient's blood and modified and engineered in order to transduce a CAR, a TCR, OLNK, to deal with the tumor. But I'm going to focus on another type of cell therapy, which are the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, the TILs. What does it mean? We get a piece of the tumor, and we do have lymphocytes present. They are the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, which are, have as a name, in principle, to kill the tumoral cell. So we get a bit of the tumor. We extract these lymphocytes at the lab. We culture them and expand them. And then we reinfuse them to the patient with the hope of having revitalized and re-strengthened those lymphocytes that had as a name the killing the tumor. The treatment for TIL is only given once daily, very different from other oncological therapies. It is given once, but it is a very complex delivery. First, we do lymphodepletion chemotherapy, high dose lymphodepletic uh, chemotherapy to select uh, <coughs> the populations. Then we <coughs> administer the uh, lymphocytes expanded in the laboratory, and finally, high dose interleukin 2. Interleukin 2 at a high dose feeds the lymphocytes so that they expand and become functional. It is a very complex treatment for um, the fun manufacturing side and toxicity as well. We have seen the toxicity profile of CAR T cells. We will have similar toxicities. And the vast majority of the patients have severe, serious toxicities, grades 3 and 4. You need specialized teams familiar with this therapy. So uh, what with being so complex in production and treatment, it's taken a very long time to reach clinical practice. But it's true that in the last few years, we've been seeing a clear advances in the cell therapies. And these slides, in my opinion, illustrate very nicely the tsunami we are witnessing now. 
on, on this chart, you can see the number of clinical trials with different agents, and it's been an increase with the checkpoint uh, inhibitors. This is 2021, and it's still growing more, and now it's 23. That's more than 5,500 clinical trials with checkpoint inhibitors, and this tsunami is just growing. And on the other graph, the different kinds of immunotherapy. And I'd like to point out that cell therapy are precisely those that are growing at a higher rate. We can see an increasing potential of this type of uh, Ultra precise medicine. It's the lymphocyte attacking the tumor, manipulating it or stimulating it in order to kill the tumor. And I'd also like to underscore that these exercises in cell therapy were initiatives belonging to the academia. It was only academic centers that were under taking these uh, initiatives, mostly in the USA, as you saw before, in the USA, in China, slightly in Europe. But in the last years, we've had uh, financing available with small startups and biotechs and the pharma industry as well, which is accelerating greatly the introduction of cell therapies. And you can see here how to up 30% of venture capital goes to biotech companies. So it's a clear sign of the uh, momentum this uh, therapy development is gaining. Let's go back to the um, facts mentioned in the uh, prior presentation. This is not new. This is the first reports on TILS, which go back in uh, 50 years at the NIH study, you know, uh, but it was very promising. Uh, publication. These were melanoma patients, and up to 60% of the patients could have an immune type of response, and that some of these responses were quite uh, durable or even complete responses. So many years ago, we could have a glimpse already of what it would mean in oncotherapy in the future. Main advantages of cell therapies. Well, on the hand hand, we can deliver and administer a very high number of cells which are tumor specific personalized ultra personalized medicine and these cells may be activated ex vivo and or genetically engineered to enhance their anti-tumoral activity. And we shall also be able to uh, modify the microenvironment of the tumor so that these cell therapies be even more effective yet. Here's an example. If you're not familiar with patients' images, here's the liver. They should look more like this, but the black points, black uh, dark points are metastatic lesions. And this patient had uh, an increase in growth of the tumor, and after the tills, they disappear very quickly in 34 days. And this is durable in time. That's the beautiful thing in cellular therapy. You saw that girl growing year after year, disease-free. That's the beautiful thing. A one-time administration of TILS, and we have data of 10 years survival free of metastasis in patients. So in the last uh, years, we started using TILS and gaining experience. This is a meta-analysis published several years ago where we grouped information from the different clinical trials, usually phase one or phase two of uh, cell therapy in melanoma. There's a clear benefit. Up to 40% of the patients do respond. And once again, I insist that the beautiful thing is that those that exhibit response will show a very long-lasting response, a durable response in time. This is what we're all looking for as oncologists. In the last two years also, there's been a, a publication of phase one and phase two clinical trials of the Iowan pharmaceutical company, where they use TILS in melanoma patients who had already received checkpoint inhibitors. In the majority of the study before, the patients had not received checkpoint inhibitors. But once again, we see a good response. Each one of these bars represents a patient, and below the line show the shrinkage, the tumor shrinkage. The majority, 80% of the patients, do have some type of benefit with tumor volume reduction, and 36% have a partial response, as we call it, a decrease of more than 30%, which is, would be uh, the second horizontal dotted line. It's a clear benefit. 
to the patients and durable responses in time. Here you can see the durability of the response quite long. So this 36% was perhaps slightly lower than reported beforehand, but this is a heavily treated uh, population to begin with. And I do want to underscore this publication of about two months ago. For the first time ever, we published a phase three clinical trials with TILS. Well, usually the experience so far were small clinical trials, phase one, phase two. This is the first one, phase three, clinical trials to use uh, TILS comparing uh, to the standard treatment with ipilimumab and melanoma, first line or second line, mostly second line. Eh? I have to mention that this is a huge effort, tra treating 160 patients. Eight years it took us uh, to finish the clinical trial so that you can have an idea of the difficulty and complexity of these studies. Eight years for this RCT, which is very relevant indeed. You really have to acknowledge how difficult it is to change the standards for certain diseases. And in this RCT, the patients were randomized to TILS or epilimumab, as I said, which is another checkpoint inhibitor. And you can see very clearly there is a greater benefit in the patients with TILS. There's much more bars below the line than with epilimumab below. The response rate was 49% with TILS versus 21% in the epilimumab group. It's a higher response rate than one we saw before, uh, probably because these patients had received less lines of therapy before. And once again, it is durable in time with PFS greater in the TILS treated group versus the uh, control arm with epilimumab. And this was a, a pivotal trial, the approval of TILS therapy, the first registration ever in the Netherlands on the basis of this uh, pivotal trial. And um, this is a clear landmark in cell therapy. It has been registered already, and it's a great step forward. What are we doing ourselves to try to improve upon the outcomes of cell therapy? I explained that what we do with the TILS is that we get hold of the surgical specimen from the patient, we extract the TILS, and we expand them. If we expand them because they were within the tumor, you will find TILS who were already reacting against the tumor. But no, you expand them, and you don't really know what you're expanding, OK? What we think is that we are, if we were able to recognize the TILS that are actually acting specifically against the tumor and expand only those will improve the outcome. How do we recognize these cells? It all depends on the receptor, the T cell receptor, TCR. We know that it will, there are some neoantigens, the abnormalities of the tumoral cells exhibited on the surface and displayed with the membrane receptor that is recognized by TCR, by the Ts, lymphocytes. We know that TILS may recognize different types of antigens. Some antigens are shared with normal uh, cells, but also the neoantigens. And the neoantigens are abnormalities specifically produced by the tumor. The tumor accumulates specific uh, mutations in the nucleus, and these specific mutations show the degeneration and are shown by the cell and may rec recognize by the immune system. And there are clear data that this kind of recognition of TILS, of neoantigens, is the predominant response of cell therapy. In melanomas that have the greater mutational load, they always have a better response against TILS. And there are other types of tumors, non-melanoma, that have a lower immunogenic response. And how the recognition of the neoantigens makes it possible to improve the therapy. This is the idea we're entertaining and the work we're performing. The initial approach is the same. We get a bit of a tumor, a chunk. It's just that we think that perhaps with TILS therapy, you start with surgery, right? And the surgery is another mobility and has no therapeutic purposes. So we are trying to do it with a biopsy material. So by biopsy the patients, we expand the TILS that we obtain from the biopsy, and then 
the tumor biopsy is also sequenced to infer the abnormalities or the most likely neoantigens. The neoantigens are transfected to B cells in order to present them to the TILS. So we simulate in the lab the antigenic uh, recognition of these uh, B cells, and so we uh, select only the lymphocytes that are activated by neontogens. This is an example published by another group many years ago, but shows the potential of the idea. It's an angiocarcinoma who was reinfused with non-selected T cells. But you can see the decrease in the, the disease slightly and briefly, very quickly, it went back again. When it went back again, they had already selected from the infused tills the uh, pool of the anti-tumor specific tills. Uh, it was expanded in the laboratory, and then clearly the disease goes down again. So that's a potential. If we truly find the specific and effective lymphocyte, we can improve other one, the results. So. That's a hard working hypothesis. It will be less invasive by means of biopsies, safer and more powerful, and therefore will lead to more diverse and heterogeneous response. And that finally we shall treat tumor populations that usually don't benefit from TIL so much, such as solid tumors when they're not melanomas. This is our next generation TIL. A trial. We're trying to validate the manufacturing of the product at the bio laboratories. We got tumors and several samples trying to isolate the teals. And here is the result of 154 patients as treated at our unit where we were able to expand the teals of 82% of the biopsies. And this was independent of the type of tumor. We didn't have much experience apart from melanoma back then, and also takes into account the type of treatment received before. And then these tills that we grew and cultured and expanded from the tumors were reactive to the autologous tumoral cell line that we had generated from the biopsy of the patient. And the next step, as I said, was to study the abnormalities found to see whether these cell lines of lymphocytes could recognize neontogens from the tumor or not. And we saw that, yes. We didn't make them recognize neontogens. And what's important that in each patient, neontogens were specific, patient specific. They're not really neontogens in the classical sense, but abnormalities of that particular patient that his own lymphocytes recognize. We go foundation by the BBVA Foundation and the Instituto de Salud Carlos III. Uh, we're treating 10 patients in a new clinical trial. This is the team. We collaborate with Elena Gross, who was a long time for Rosenberg in the lab at BIO, and we do all the experiments. And Vladimir Galvao and Julia Lostes at our unit, who are also involved in the patient's treatment, and uh, Silvia martin Luis Ma, who helps us with the regulatory issues. We uh, opened recruitment for clinical trial just a while ago. This approach for neo-antigen reactive TILS is uh, an idea by, used by other companies, uh, therapeutic companies with other two ideas following the same premises. We still are waiting their report to check the hypothesis. I'll try to finish my presentation discussing strategies to improve and enhance the efficacy of the TIL treatment. First one which is very logical, after all. We have the TILs that are effective. We have the checkpoint inhibitors, which are effective. What about combination of both? That's probably the question in everybody's mind and the, the easiest strategy to resort to. There are many uh, clinical trials testing this hypothesis. Very few reported results so far. This is the IOVAN study with the same TILs that we saw before from the melanoma trials published in JCO uh, in combination with pembrolizumab. Very few patients, only 18, but response rates that are least interesting and deserve studying further. Melanoma, 60%, head and neck, uh, 40%, cervical cancer, 57%, you know, quite 
quite promising results. It's just that we need more data, obviously, to see its uh, uh, impact. But there's several clinical trials under course right now. This is only from 21, but they're testing TILs plus checkpoint inhibitors. And genetic engineering, we heard about it in the prior uh, presentation. If we can modify the TILs to be more powerful, grow faster, kill better, well, of course, we'll be improving our patients' benefits. Uh, together with Elena Gross, we are trying to find these reactive lymphocytes not within the tumor, but in peripheral blood. Why? Some tumors are not immunogenic by themselves. They don't have said lymphocytes within the tumor. But if we could recognize them and extract them from peripheral blood, well, it would be much easier, right? It would change the paradigm, actually. But uh, so far, this is just a working hypothesis. There's no ongoing clinical trial. We're just on the preclinical stage. One of the initiatives that we're working on is to decrease the toxicity of this cell therapy. As I've told you, a 100% of the patients will have serious uh, toxicities, grade 3 and 4. And this is because of the interleukin 2. In the development of uh, medication in the last uh, 10 years, five years, are new interleukins, modified interleukins that will not have these complex adverse events of the capillary syndrome, hypertension, and whatnot that make it so difficult to manage. The hypothesis that perhaps TILs together with the new interleukin-2 will have a better toxicity profile for the patients. We requested a grant to the European Union. We went through the first filter. Uh, we're in the second stage of preparation. We hope to get it launched uh, by April. It's not 100 percent sure. I hope everything goes right. But it will be a clinical trial of phase three, comparing TILs with the uh, normal interleukin and the TILs with the modified interleukin to see whether we can decrease the toxicity of the cellular therapy. And I'd also like to underscore the uh, help of the Spanish uh, Cancer Association Foundation to develop our own uh, CGT products because they need facilities which are highly specialized with good manufacturing practices and so forth. And thanks to their support, we will uh, develop these kind of therapies at the Valdebron Hospital in Barcelona. I think I finished mentioning this editorial as a take-home message because it's the basic message. Please, tear therapy is entering the mainstream thanks to the latest advances. It is becoming an increasingly uh, frequently applied therapy, and we shall see many advances in the next uh, years. And I thank, of course, all the laboratory from Elena Gross, the clinicians working at our unit, especially Josef Tabernero, Blanche Galvao, and Julia Lostes, the whole team of the projects at DVHIO. Here you can see the almost all the full uh, staff in the financing institutes, Instituto de Salud Carlos III, the Spanish Association Against Cancer, and the BBA Foundation. And thank you very much to you all for your attention. Thank you very much. Now we are nearly at the end of this meeting. Uh, it's a very impressive presentation. In order to finish this session before the debate, and please stay for the debate as well, I would like to introduce Dr. Omid Weisse. Dr. Weisse, the doctor from Washington University. He is a researcher and professor of bioengineering in the Texas University, Rice University in the States. He has more than one decade experience in the technology for clinical application. He has 20 patents registered, some of them already uh, of, of, awarded. Since 2017, professor at the Rice University in Houston. His lab is centered in the platform of biotechnology platforms. And the result of his postdoc uh, research led him led the lab of Dr. Bob Langer to develop cell therapies that were used for the development base of the development of a new company. Professor Bessé worked in the development of a bioartificial pancreas for the treatment of type 1 diabetes. He developed a 
high throughput line for the synthesis and assessment of formulations of materials able to withstand uh, reactions to foreign bodies. Uh, his lab uses advanced techniques of nano, micro, and ma micro and macro fabrication combined with cell biology and cell engineering to develop platforms of implantable uh, devices that allow for the chemical detection and the administration of therapies as well. Uh, the research of Professor Weisse and his lab is especially focused on the development of technology to improve the treatment of cancer, type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, and other autoimmune diseases. In the talk today, Dr. Beyse will talk about the use of advanced materials combined with genetic engineering to create a new generation of cell therapies, advanced cell therapies. Thank you to the organizers for, the, uh, for bringing us all together and to uh, Nature for uh, sponsoring this meeting. And uh, it's, a, it's great to be here in Madrid. And uh, my pleasure to talk to you a little bit about what my lab's been working on in the area of developing immune modulatory biomaterials to enable some of the cell therapies that we've heard about today. Just real quick, some disclosures on any real or perceived conflicts of interest is managed by our dean's office at Rice University. And the work I'm going to present today is primarily focused on uh, some of our translational efforts, which has been licensed to Avenge Bio, a company that's based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So a big theme around the projects in my lab is bringing biologics production into the patient. When we think about the pharmaceutical industry today, many of the drugs that are in development are biologic in nature. Biologics are made by cells in giant bioreactors. There's a pretty uh, difficult process to isolate, purify, put them in vials, figure out how to stabilize them, and then re-administer them back into the patient. So what we've been thinking about is innovative ways where we can actually take the cells, combine them with biomaterials, and bring that manufacturing actually into the patient. This decreases cost, increase, improves logistics, and actually allows us to do really innovative things in terms of localizing where the therapy is produced and leverage some of the unique abilities of cells to sense and respond uh, to their environment to produce conditionally active biologics. So we think that this could be the future and we're thinking about it in the context of many different diseases. Um, with this approach, we can produce any type of hormone, antibody, um, molecules like insulin, as well as cytokines. But today, the focus of my talk is going to be aimed at mostly uh, Im immunotherapy and producing immunotherapy-relevant biologics for cancer. So the, the platform that um, we've been working on building now for over a decade is thinking about innovative designs of biomaterials where if you implant the material, the material itself would provide signals to the immune system that basically tell the immune system how it should perceive it. And we've done this through a high throughput approach where we develop large libraries of now up to almost like 10,000 formulations of chemically modified. Um, and so these compounds kind of look like these where we have small molecules. Whoops, let me just go back one where we have um, small molecules like this attached to polymers of alginate, which is a hydrogel, which is porous, and this porosity creates a structure that allows the fusion of materials in and out of the hydrogel. Um, that could be the biologics we're making, but also when the cells are implanted into the patient, they access nutrients and oxygen, just like any other cells of the body. But the beauty of the material is that it excludes immune cells, from physically contacting our cells. So this enables the use of allogeneic or xenogeneic cells in human patients. And just a little illustration of how this works and based on the design of the material, we can either produce materials like this, which we've developed to be immunostimulatory, where in this context, the material, these little spheres that we've made are in magenta. And what we're looking at is about six hours of video of macrophages that have been activated in response to this material and are producing an inflammatory response. By contrast, we can create small molecule modified hydrogels 
where in the same setting, the immune system actually is not activated and they don't adhere to the material and they sort of ignore it. And this allows us to control the duration by which our therapy remains active. So we have formulations that we've tested now and can keep allogeneic cells alive for six months to a year in non-human primates. And we have some that actually provoke an immune response and turn off much uh, sooner. And those are the ones we prioritize for the immunotherapy applications I'm gonna talk about today. So we're really interested in, in cytokine therapy and, and the previous speaker really highlighted one critical cytokine, interleukin-2. And so interleukin-2 is a very powerful molecular messenger that tells immune cells to become activated. And in particular, T cells and macrophages and NK cells, when they become activated, they could be really good effector molecules that can go after and kill the cancer cells. But historically, the way it's been used is you administer these cytokines through the bloodstream. And in our bloodstream, we have a lot of reservoirs of immune cells. So if you activate them all simultaneously, you can imagine it creates quite a lot of a cytokine storm, and that's what limits the therapeutic utility of it. It has to be done in an ICU unit because it takes very careful dosing. Now, the body uses these cytokines differently. They're almost always locally produced at a particular site, and they're short-lived and fast-acting. But the nature of getting the drugs into the body requires injection, we thought, let's think about this paradigm differently. Let's create these factories where we can produce the cytokines locally, and naturally, because of how they degrade quickly, it keeps them out of the bloodstream. And this is relevant for a large variety of different cytokines, with the most trials uh, centered around IL-2. But the nature of our platform is we can actually very quickly cycle through and evaluate and test different individual cytokines or combinations of cytokines. So we were inspired um, by some proof of concept data in ovarian cancer, whereby um, Edwards ran several trials. Um, Edwards is a gynecological oncologist at the University of Pittsburgh who ran several trials about 20 years ago where um, you know, he was focused on treating really advanced ovarian cancer patients. And ovarian cancer is a particularly dismal disease. Most patients are diagnosed late at stage three. And at that point, it's highly likely that they will have recurrence, and recurrence is almost always fatal. So the trial that Edwards did was unique because he actually went after the really difficult recurrent population where the life expectancy was about three to 12 months and um, without treatment, unfortunately, most of the, almost all the patients should have um, not survived. But what he did was something really innovative and he took this interleukin-2 and he hooked up these patients to a pump system and infused in daily two liters of interleukin-2 into the peritoneal space. And this created locally very high concentrations of this molecule and in this trial, he had really exciting results. Six of the patients had responses out of 24, and four were complete responses. But the problem was this, this approach was really complicated to have patients hooked up to like a pump and catheter system. There was a lot of infections, a lot of occlusions of the catheter, so it was never widely adopted. And also, the nature of this disease is a lot of fluid builds up in the peritoneal space from the cancer, and many patients couldn't even tolerate the addition of the two liters that was necessary. So we thought, let's create these little beads that house cells that would produce interleukin-2. And with this, we were able to really dramatically reduce the amount that we would need to administer. Rather than two liters for a human patient, we're now down at half a, a five milliliters for one human patient of these beads. And these beads, each of them are 1.5 millimeters in size, and they house about 40,000 cells that have been engineered to produce different cytokine. And based on our results, we're prioritizing IL-2. To do this, we had to come up with unique cell chassis, which would be clinically translatable and actually would allow us to control dosing, because if we just put cells in the body and they had the ability to continue growing, that wouldn't really work. So we prioritize um, 
uh, some criteria that allowed us to arrive to ARP19 cells, which are normally cells that reside in the back of the eye and they act like immune cells there and support cells. So we repurposed them for, for this application where we could genetically manipulate these cells and engineer them to produce any biologic we want. But in this case, we did it by IL-2. And then we were able to package them in our beads and administer them to the IP space. And when we did this through many rounds of optimization with different material choices, we identified one that actually works pretty nicely in, in the context that you would want for an IL-2 therapy in that for three to four weeks, it remains active. And after three to four weeks, the cells become over, the capsules become overgrown because of the immune response to the material. And then the cells just die off. And so this is a one-shot administration where the cells now live inside the patient. And each day, they're producing about 10 picograms of IL-2 per cell per day. And this accumulates locally in the interperitoneal space, achieving what Edwards was able to do, but now in a much more patient-friendly manner. And because of the nature of the cytokines and how they uh, break down very quickly, very little of it makes it into the blood. And you contrast that with traditional administration of IL-2, where every eight hours you have to do infusions into the bloodstream. By controlling the number of spheres we gave, we could actually adjust dosing, so we could do um, a low dose or a high dose based on the number, just like you would by administering biologics. And a lot of engineering went into the ability to do that. And the nice thing about this approach is that you could also re-administer. So you could do a cycle for a few weeks and then come back and give another dose of the therapy, again, to, to the local compartment. And because we're producing the biologic on site, we can actually leverage the natural interleukin-2 that is genetically encoded into our body. When many of the biologics become commercialized, they often have to be re-engineered and be turned into a recombinant. In the case of IL-2, the amino acid sequence of what is FDA approved as proleukin is actually a different amino acid sequence than what our body makes. This actually affects the potency of the molecule in that the native one is much more potent, and we've shown that uh, in our studies. And also, um, in many of the IL-2 trials, the patients develop neutralizing antibodies to the IL-2 because it's not self-made. So by being able to produce the, the natural molecule that our body makes, we get potency advantages, but also stronger efficacy advantages. So to test this concept, we first worked in this ID8 model of ovarian cancer which is a particularly difficult one. It's traditionally not responsive to immunotherapy. Um, and we did a study where we compared our cell-generated cytokine factory compared to recombinant IL-2, as well as controls of capsules that don't make anything and also sham mice. Where we went through these uh, iterations of testing, we got some really exciting results in that the cytokine factories were able to eliminate eradicate these really difficult tumors in ways that the recombinant administration could not. And when we looked at why this could be by probing the immune response, we noticed that these um, IL-2 producing capsules are able to activate the effector immune population like we would expect locally. And also these cells were migrating through the um, lymph nodes into the systemic uh, space as well. So while the therapy was local, we were seeing immune activation, which was more systemic, which was exciting to see because we, you know, in many cancers, the disease is disseminated. So we wanted to educate the immune system and then those immune cells could go find the cancer as opposed to delivering the IL-2 everywhere in the body, which could be toxic. We also tested this in a mouse model of MC38, which is a colorectal cancer model. And again, we saw really dramatic efficacy results in terms of um, being able to eliminate the tumor, again, in ways that recombinant IL-2 could not. And we also came back and did a study where in mice that we had successfully treated, we challenged them in a different compartment, the same tumor again. And we were able to show that because of the local immune education and the development of memory T cells, these mice were now immune to the same type of cancer and the cancer could not come back, again, signaling to us that there was a systemic immune entrainment 
that you know, the local therapy was facilitating. We also advanced this to non-human primate testing uh, to show whether to really test to see if we could, uh, if we address some of the toxicity challenges. The ones uh, that we observe in humans are actually much more prevalent in the non-human primate than they are in rodents. And we saw really the ability to both control dosing in terms of the number of capsules we could administer. And the drug that was being produced was being uh, localized in just the intraperitoneal space, not getting into the bloodstream. And we also had the benefit of the trial that Edwards had done in that when he was administering the IL-2, he was measuring how much concentration gradients he was creating in the IP space as well as the blood. And so in the highest dose he could achieve, which was 38,600, we were able to go well beyond that because again, we didn't need to administer liters of therapy. We could just have this factory that is producing high concentrations in that compartment. And so at all dose levels, we didn't see any toxicity because our hypothesis is IL-2 is toxic when it gets in high concentrations to the bloodstream. But if you keep it local, just like how the immune system works, it works really well. And we noticed that you know, through this administration, we're able to activate the effector T-cell populations locally, which also appear in the blood, as well as we don't see expansion of suppressive T-cells, which is one of the challenges with IL-2 therapy. At low doses, it could expand T-cells, which it doesn't in this case. And that the non-human primates in this case were doing really well in terms of all measures of safety and toxicity. Now, this therapy we developed for peritoneal ovarian cancer, but we also noticed that there had been other examples where clinicians had tried to do local administrations to other cavity. Another particular area was in the pleural cavity for mesothelioma. And there was good proof of concept, again, where through constant administration of IL-2 into the pleural cavity, uh, clinicians were starting to see some really nice responses in terms of both efficacy for these patient populations. And we noticed the same thing where if we administered our beads to the pleural cavity, we see again high concentrations building locally but not really getting into the blood. So we tested this in a mouse model of uh, mesothelioma, AB1 tumors, which are also very difficult and have a very suppressive microenvironment. And we saw a really nice treatment efficacy that's dose responses based on the amount of capsules we were implanting. And we also combined this with PD-1 therapy, which is commonly used for this patient population. And we saw that our therapy synergized really well to the point where we were able to eradicate these tumors in 100% of the mice. And then when we, again, we, we challenged them in a different compartment in the subcutaneous space. The entrainment was durable in that the mice were now immune to the same cancer. And we did some CYTOF profiling, and we saw some really exciting differences, both in terms of activation of the, the immune cells, but in this case, we looked at one of the big challenges with mesothelioma and many other cancers is that you get a lot of suppressive immune cells in the microenvironment, which limits the function of the effector T cells. And because our material itself is inflammatory, we were seeing a really nice synergic benefit of combining it with the IL-2. And now we were polarizing the immune cell profiles from an M2-like phenotype, nat naturally, to an M1, more inflammatory phenotype, which further explains why we think our therapy is working so well and robustly in these difficult tumor models. And of course, we saw expansion of effector T cells still, um, including uh, memory cells, which are critical for uh, protection against recurrence and also when the cancer is disseminated throughout the body. Um, so we were excited to see uh, that the immunology was matching up with the therapeutic efficacy that we were observing. So based on the exciting results we had, we formed a, a spin-out company called Avenge Bio. We were fortunate enough to be able to raise $45 million at the beginning of 2022. And um, we have been approved by the FDA to start our phase one slash two clinical trial. We're prioritizing ovarian cancer. 
This is what the trial looks like. We have a, it's a dose escalation trial as a monotherapy where we administer these beads at different dose levels. We have four different doses that we've come up with based on the NHP data that we did and also the work that Edwards did to really kind of start at around where we think it's efficacious and be able to go above that until we see you know, potential toxicity. And this trial just kicked off actually um, uh, at the end of 2022, and this is kind of how the therapy works. You know, the patient goes in, and through a catheter system, the beads are administered um, into the uh, peritoneal cavity, and um, then they just sit there, and you can kind of see them, there are little bubbles that just kind of sit there, and um, just produce IL-2 on a daily basis. They last for um, about four weeks, and then the therapy ceases, and if we need to, we can come back in and give another dose of the therapy. So we're really excited about the progress of our ovarian cancer program, but we have a deep pipeline of other cancer indications at Avengebio, including leveraging uh, IL-12 for pancreatic as well as other solid tumors, and developing more local checkpoints as well, which we think could be beneficial. With that, I wanted to thank my team. A lot of the work that I presented was led by Amanda Nash, a really talented PhD student in my lab. Um, Samira and, and Maria also contributed heavily to the work, and the rest of the team uh, who was working on various projects, but we have a really collaborative group. And I wanted to thank a big group of collaborators, um, both at, at Rice as well as throughout the, the world, really, um, and our funding sources. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Weise, as well, for your excellent presentation. Now we are going to have the round of questions, the debate. The speakers can come up to the podium. And as I said, questions from the audience as well. We will start with questions from the audience as well, if there are any. Please, using the microphone for the questions. Please go ahead. So my question is for Professor Omid Beis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi. So you've come so lost, like so far along in your investigation and your um, vision for the future. How, what do you think is the next step after all all that you've listened to and all of the, that you've learned about? The next step. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm personally motivated by the uh, unmet need of the patients, right? Like we're actually. The Rice University is in Te Texas Medical Center, which is the largest medical center in the world. And it's amazing interfacing with the clinicians and you see, as engineers, how many problems we could address to improve the lives of patients. So I like to tackle problems like that where we can kind of use our engineering uh, approaches to, to make things better. Like in this case that I presented, I mean, there was sort of like a crude therapy approach that kind of worked, but it wasn't really widely adoptable. So how can we come in as engineers and come up with a solution to really make that happen? Great, thank you. Sure. Can I ask a question? Uh, absolutely, please. So, because I'm, I'm very curious from a drug development perspective, um, because, I mean, the toxicity of IL-2, the reality is once you start having it, you, you kind of stop dosing, and then you need to manage it, but it will reverse kind of quickly if you stop dosing. So, I mean, I'm a bit, how are you planning? Because you put these beads in, if you manage, if you have a toxicity, how are you going to manage? Because if for one month, despite the toxicity, the patient is going to keep having interleukin too. So what's the yeah. salvage point there? So, yeah, really good point. I mean, I think, you know, immunotherapies in general have that challenge, and that's why we purposely kind of thought about actually something that worked more shorter term which was several weeks to a month. Um, 
but you know, you inject an antibody, you have the same challenge, right? Because it's gonna circulate for, for a few weeks. Thankfully, I think, because of all the great work the clinicians have done over the years, they've gotten really good at managing it using drugs like steroids, you know, with dexamethasone and other ways you can really turn down the immune system if you really needed to. But we think that our approach really drastically expands the therapeutic index of IL-2 to the point where it doesn't need to be as finely managed as what, as what is available today for patients. I'd like to ask a question to all the speakers then. Uh, so obviously there's a lot of potential to combination therapy. We've seen that already, but you know, there, we, we've already heard it just tonight four different approaches. Um, so I just want to take your, you know, your take individually as to where you see the most promise in your field for the cancer you're treating in terms of combination therapies. Maybe Evelyn. Yeah, I, I think that's really um, a conclusion we can come to. Um, also after all these presentations and insightful informations that um, probably we need um, not only one single approach but to combine different um, technologies and I believe um, modulation of immune cells is a possibility, modulation of stem cells but they need cytokines, it would be a great advantage to give cytokines in a higher dosing at a local site. We have heard that we can also apply immune cells at a local site or take them from the tumor. What I think is the next very challenging question is to find out um, which personalized approach is the best one for an individual patient and his disease. Yeah. And um, I believe that um, we have now, we are at the stage with a lot of knowledge that we need to bring together and to figure that out in appropriate, maybe preclinical, um, also functional and um, next generation sequencing approaches of patients' um, tumor cells. Well, I think um, it's clear. I completely agree with you. I think combinations is uh, the, the, the logical next step. The issue is what to combine and which patient needs, <laughs> needs uh, which combination. So um, checkpoint inhibitors, of course, are, are a logical combination because of what they have already shown in the clinic and because it, it really has... Uh, the big potential of the big involvement in, in many tumor types. So in immuno, immunogenic tumors, this is probably a combination that, that, that makes a lot of sense. But the issue is when there's uh, the, the cold tumors or they're not so immunogenic tumors. Here, we will need other combinations and other approaches. And uh, of course, we've not talked about B-specifics or other type of T-cell engagers to bring T-cells into the tumors. But probably for these cold tumors, we will need uh, more of these T cell engages where you are attracting the, the, the T cells to the tumor in a different way. So, yeah, it will all be about seeing the, the specific mechanism of that tumor and the immune evasion of that tumor to see the combination. I agree. Yeah, I think I agree. I think combinations is going to be the future. I mean, cancer is such a challenging disease, and we're really at the early stages of uncovering how the immune system perceives and reacts and all the mechanisms by which the cancer is really shutting down the immune system. But I think ultimately, um, as these new modalities emerge, it's also important to be able to demonstrate that each of the components does something unique in, in human patients, right? Because otherwise, um, you know, it's, it's unlikely that we're going to have situations where something that doesn't work very well on its own and then you combine it and it starts working. So I think demonstrating in good clinical trials, monotherapy efficacy, and then switching to combinations really is, is probably where we're headed over the next few years. Yes, on my side, I'm working more prim primarily on uh, genetic diseases. So on my end, we're talking less about combination therapy, but on, on, the, other, on the other end, we're trying to um, combine two different effects to achieve the uh, highest, to reach the highest number of stem cells that we want to correct. So in a way, yes, we have also, we are also developing combination therapies in that, in that sense, in that 
For example, one approach that com would combine in vivo gene therapy, so delivering the vector directly in vivo and reaching the stem cells, with another therapy that would uh, allow for this, the few stem cells that you are able to reach to expand and uh, um, fill the niche at the expense of the others would be to combine the in vivo gene therapy with an antibody treatment that would essentially clear the cells that are not gene corrected. So you, you, you act on two, on two mechanisms at the same time. You gene correct a certain portion of cells, and then you deplete of the cells that are not correct, so you make more space for the cells that are corrected to expand. And there are uh, interesting applications in that, in that regard, too, that uh, I think will be, will be the future of in vivo gene therapy, um, and we will definitely make the difference when it comes to the clinical translation. I have a question for all speakers in general. So how would these immunotherapy treatments change or adapt themselves if the patient already had an immunodeficiency? So if their immune system was already unhealthy before the cancer, have any investigations been done in that area? So it's, the reality is that we have few data on, um, on a lot of these therapies that are experimental. So uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors, um, the, the initial trials all excluded patients that had primary immunodeficiencies. Um, but uh, for example, now that there's more experience with, um, with the approved checkpoint inhibitors, there's some protocols that are really evaluating the efficacy of these drugs in HIV patients uh, mainly, and we are starting gaining data on that. But for most of these new therapies that are in phase one, phase two, if patients that have these immunodeficiencies are currently excluded of the clinical trials. And this is because there's so few data that you really need to ensure um, the safety um, in a population where you can really relate the results later. Um, so uh, it, it's, it's uh, sometimes uh, unfair when you have the, the concrete patient on, on front, uh, but it's really the, the safest thing to do. Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, it's early still in the days of immunotherapy, of course. But I think what's also exciting is some of the same technologies and tools that are being developed today could in the future be therapies for autoimmune diseases as well as people that have immunodeficiencies. Like, for example, in my work, we're, we're starting to think about, you know, a certain people can't get vaccination because their immune system is poorly functioning. But we have the ability to produce long-term the antibodies in the patient. So could we you know, circumvent the vaccination process and just produce the neutralizing antibodies in the patient? And we've recently gotten some support from the Gates Foundation to actually do this for HIV. Um, so we'll see how it goes, but I think there's a lot of parallels for these approaches in other contexts. I'll ask another question while the audience warms up. So we, or is there a question? Oh yeah, right there. Sure. So I got a question for Dr. Elena Garralda. How, wait, why do we use B cells for presenting the antigens instead other APCs such as dendritic cells? So this is a question that I have discussed a lot with Elena Gross. Um, the reality is that she had experience with the B cells as the presenting antigen cells and uh, in her experience uh, they, they, they are the most easily reproducible in, in the lab. So I don't have data myself but I, I trust her and her experiments but, and, and that's why we're normally doing in in B cells. So I don't know if there's a concrete reason per se, but I think that's the way that uh, she also uh, learned how to do it. Thanks. Also, B cells are much more easy to obtain from the patient. 
Okay, thank you for your presentations. I have two questions. Can I make two? Yes. <laughs> the first one is for Professor Huldrich. You mentioned that sometimes you can make car NK uh, cells from a cell line of NK cells. What happens with those cells after the infusion? Do they live forever with the patient? Yeah. Um, that is an, an NK cell or an NK-like cell line, NK92 is it called, and um, it's isolated from a lymphoma patient with an NK cell lymphoma, and therefore there are some safety issues. So in preclinical context, the cell line stably express um, cytokines and can uh, proliferate very well. Um, under addition of IL-2, <laughs> for instance, it's also a key cytokine for these NK92 cells. But when it's uh, applied now in the first human clinical trials um, in Frankfurt, we have to irradiate this cell line before. And therefore, I can't answer really this question because this irradiation makes them working for a few days and afterwards they don't proliferate anymore. It's just a safety um, issue for the moment. And therefore, we now develop um, the CAR and K cell product with primary NK cells. As then, we are allowed to let these cells proliferate. Thank you. And the other question is for Professor Baisa. Uh, it's a great tool, what you got there. But sometimes, from, we have cell lines in the lab which are dependent on the presence of some cytokine or other biological molecule. Have you tried these factories for like these in vitro functions? Are they? Yeah, they, they actually work really well. And you know, we have collaborators that now ask us to, to make them some. And, and in fact, we have them like cryopreserved. So as, as the beads, so we can you know, give them to people and you can just drop a few in, in like a giant reactor and that would be enough to kind of produce the cytokines you need. So it, it can work in that context. So we're interested in the manufacturing space as well. Thanks very much for the talks. So how do you envision uh, these cell therapies and immunotherapies with existing chemotherapy or even targeted small molecule therapies? Are they going to substitute? Are they going to coexist? Um, yeah, so I, I think, you know, um, chemotherapy is quite a very crude way of, you know, treating cancers, right? Because, I mean, in some cases they work well, but the side effects are really terrible. And um, in the process, the patients get resistance. I think immunotherapy, when it works, it works so much better in terms of both durability as well as, you know, there are side effects involved, but they're not as bad as you know, what you get with, with a lot of the chemotherapy trials. So I think it's a new arsenal that can complement each other, but hopefully as we get better and better with these immunotherapy tools that they could replace chemotherapy. I think targeted therapies still have a place, particularly for tumors that don't really have a lot of um, unique mutations, but perhaps they have one or two very specific types of mutations that the targeted therapies could address. Um, so, so I think, you know, the more options for patients, the better, for sure. Yeah, I, mean, I agree. I, I think it's very difficult that chemotherapy is eradicated. I think it's, um, but what we need to learn is once again how we're going to combine it. So, for example, there are different approaches really using chemotherapy as a way to engage tumor death and make tumors more immunogenic, kind of generating a life vaccination and then enhancing it with checkpoint inhibitors. So, and there are patients that we already know that chemo plus checkpoint inhibition works better than checkpoint inhibition alone. So once again, we're, we're back to the point that it, it will really depend on each of the patients. But I think it's going to be strange that chemo is eradicated. It's more that perhaps it will be relegated to a smaller subset of, of, of patients or will manage to treat more patients without chemotherapy. And targeted therapies, yes, I, th I think that's, that's a different realm because that's patients that normally uh, really have a low tumor mutation uh, burden. They are uh, much more clonal in nature. And here, 
the effects of, of, of targeted therapy can be really dramatic. It's true that they develop resistance and we need to find ways to prolong and cure these cancers. And immunotherapy could be a, an answer, but I think it's, it's rare that this, um, this type of treatments just go away. Evelyn, did you wanna? Yeah, maybe I just wanted to add that I, I believe that um, um, we have classifications and standard therapies um, for, for cancer patients, so for leukemia patients, we know um, which um, subtypes of um, leukemias with which translocations, for instance, in the, in the genetic analysis of the um, leukemic cells um, have a higher risk than others and therefore are classifications when these patients need um, higher dose chemotherapy, more cycles of chemotherapy, and also sometimes allogenic stem cell transplantation to improve the immune system by transplantation of a healthy one. Um, and then we have more and more elderly patients, and, some, and this patient group is not, um, yeah, um, um, suitable to get this difficult treatment with large side effects. So often patients above 75 suffering from acute myeloid leukemia cannot get an allergenic stem cell transplantation due to other um, severe, severe side effects and, um, and risks they have at their age. And they, I believe, a replacement with protocols with lower dose chemotherapy to prepare um, the engraftment of um, engineered immune cells can be helpful. And we will learn stepwise where we can um, um, replace chemotherapy or lower the dose of chemotherapy of established protocols for immune cell therapy. Because I mean, it would be a high risk to say we know that. Um, we have so, so much experience giving this type of chemotherapy, even if there are side effects, the chance of survival is, um, standard, uh, is based on standardized protocols. So it's always risky to change these regimens and to come with a new therapy. So it will be a stepwise procedure. Um, hello. Uh, thank you for, sorry, yeah, four really inspiring talks. I just have a since someone's mentioned about resistance, I just wonder what your thoughts are when you apply strong selection pressure against an agent that can change, that agent will try and evade that selection pressure. And presumably a lot of the reasons that tumours don't get cured or the patients with tumours don't get cured is because resistance is happening, at least in some proportion. And I wonder what your thoughts are about that going to the future. Yeah, maybe I can start. I mean, there are many um, different um, factors that uh, play a role for um, treatment resistance of tumors. Huh? One possibility is that you have a heterogeneous um, composition of tumor cells, and some of the cells, the major percentage, um, will um, respond to a certain therapy and others resist. And then um, if, if a part only has different um, molecules on the surface and you have T cells or other immune cells that attack these um, specific tumor cells, the others can grow out. Yeah? And sometimes you see no tumor at all, but maybe there are tumor initiating cells, so-called cancer stem cells. Yeah? Their nature is not that well defined yet because they can persist in niches. So when you measure uh, tumor cells in the peripheral blood, you don't see them. Perhaps they are in a tissue niche or in a bone marrow. And then the disease can grow up after a while of um, response. Yeah? That's a later relapse period. And then there's also the fact that um, the immune environment has factors that um, diminish um, the immune system in the tumor um, surrounding area. That's um, immune inhibition. And when all these factors come together, then um, there's a selection procedure and um, that um, leads to resistance and tumors that come up. And I think we now have the tools to define the factors that make um, resistancy 
and, um, and we can uh, characterize the, um, the relapse, yeah, relapsing cells and decide if there is a chance to treat with the same treatment as before or if we have to change or to adapt the therapy and to come to a combination because now an immunosuppressive factor has grown up or antigens have changed. Yeah, I mean, I think resistance is uh, why tumors, or one of the reasons tumors are difficult to treat. I mean, it's, it's tumors are dynamic, and I don't think there's going to be any treatment that says you're never going to have resistance. It's true that there's uh, some patients um, with this kind of life treatments that generate this long memory, and for now we have not seen these resistance mechanisms occur, but for a lot of patients this resistance happens. So I think that's, uh, that's, that's the challenge. It's interesting, for example, um, how with these TIL therapies we are really seeing how, how these tumor-infiltrated lymphocytes and the probability of finding these tumor-infiltrated lymphocytes actually decreases in patients that are exposed to the immune checkpoint inhibitor. So there's probably some kind of immunoediting as a mechanism of resistance. And even if it's preliminary data, we are really starting to see that we are finding less of these stills. And if you actually go and see the, the, the Iovans trial in melanoma patients, and you see the subgroup analysis, you see that it's a bit of counterintuitive because those patients that have been more exposed to a checkpoint inhibitors are the ones that are responding less instead of more. So uh, perhaps there is some resistant mechanism and immunoediting that is happening there. But it's small numbers and very preliminary data. But I agree, it's, it's, it's the challenge. So I, I was really intrigued to hear Evelyn talk about trans, the transposon story, which, you know, it's kind of gives a lot of hope for sort of new technologies coming to the field and sort of changing uh, the potential or, or addressing some of the caveats that these, these therapies have. They're incredibly complex. They're incredibly expensive to generate. Uh, so there are still a lot of challenges. So, you know, as we end uh, the debate, I want to hear a little bit about what is exciting you in terms, each of you, in terms of new technologies or basic science developments that you think will impact your field in the future, in the coming years, I guess. <laughs> so, um, I, I completely agree that um, actually the um, translation of the immunotherapy is, is very long and very, yeah, very um, challenging in terms of, um, that's a like, um, very expensive procedure and I hope that we will develop technologies to shorten um, the um, production period we need to make these immune cells and to lower costs by, for instance, non-viral editing of immune cells. That's a possibility. And um, we can also um, improve then the outcome and the persistence of immune cells by applying um, cytokines in vivo, for instance. Yeah. yeah, on my side, I think I, I I touched upon this during my presentation. I think the main uh, evolution and uh, the main thing that we're all looking forward in the field of uh, uh, stem cell gene therapy is the in vivo approach. And there are different ways to get there. Uh, we can either use uh, lipid nanoparticles, and essentially most of us sitting here today already received uh, uh, in vivo delivery of mRNA through in, in lipid nanoparticles already. So this field moved uh, forward dramatically over the past two years, and now there's a lot of interest in how you can reach these cells directly in the niche in vivo. Uh, at the same time, gene therapy is a, is, is a little strange because the gene therapy for stem cells works very well, the ex vivo approach when you take the cells out of the patient, but it's not cost effective. So one of the key challenges for the gene therapy field is to reduce the cost of the drug. These are the most expensive drugs in the market. We are talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars for a single treatment. But they work. So we are in this space where the patients are waiting to be treated, but you just, just not, there, is not a, there isn't any financial infrastructure to support this. 
So one of uh, the things I'm really looking forward to for, for the field is to really reduce the cost of these drugs, and you do that either by changing the type of approach, and in vivo gene therapy is one way, and also by potentially uh, talking with the regulatory agencies and try to find a way where you can reduce the cost associated to the preclinical de development, because this takes many years, as you know, and is a big uh, uh, fraction of uh, eventually the cost that gets uh, they get factored in, uh, in your drug uh, product. So I'm really looking forward for uh, solutions to these two main issues, and I think in the future this will be, this will be a game changer for the, for the field. Yeah, I mean, cost is, is, is clearly a challenge, um, and uh, for all these therapies and for cancer treatments in general, I mean, if, if we continue the way we are, uh, we will all be bankrupt, uh, all countries will be bankrupt if, if we need to pay for, for cancer treatments, uh, the way costs are speeding up. So yeah, I mean, this is really something that we should all have in mind, how, how we're going to make a sustainable healthcare system and all these treatments are going to be sustainable. Because uh, the reality is that the promise of them is, is big, the, the access of these drugs is going to start increasing uh, and uh, we're going to need to find a way that this is sustainable in the long term. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I think there's a, a lot of work initially that highlighted the feasibility and proof of concept, but like a lot of it was done kind of ad hoc or at single clinical sites, but we're sort of going through this transformation of really industrializing the whole process. And that, that means paying attention to cost, scaling, and, um, and leveraging technology to achieve the goals so that you can you know, make the therapy much more accessible, not just to the, to the de developed world, but also the developing world, you know, where um, the, the, they're much more price conscious as opposed to uh, maybe the Western healthcare systems. Well, with that, I'd like to thank the speakers again. Quisiera dar una ronda de aplausos para los presentadores de nuevo. Muchísimas gracias. Of applause for all the speakers. And to thank you all of you for coming here tonight for the very good questions and the participation. Thank you very much indeed.